someone I grew up listening to doing the game of the week with Tony Kubek. My co-host, Ellie Harris, remembers him playing with the Cardinals. Joe Caragiola, how you doing, Joe? I'm doing all right. I'm doing okay. Can I ask your listeners to make a contribution for a clock that works? I will. <laughs> I'm not good with time. I get my time. Hey, I, I stopped you cold. You didn't have an answer. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, so Elliot saw me play, huh? Well, I didn't see you play. I, I listened to you on the Cardinal broadcast in the 50s. Yeah, but you said your partner saw me play, did he? No. Pardon? I thought you said you had a partner that saw me play. I, I'm I'm the I'm Elliot, and well, you're Elliot, and you didn't see me play. He heard you play. I, heard me play. No, Nobody I, heard me play. By the, by the time I saw you play, you were on some awfully bad teams. Uh, no, no, no. We we didn't okay. win many teams, but they weren't bad teams. Oh, now come uh, okay. on. Okay. Okay, a question of semantics. Yeah, you, you, they were uh, victory challenged. Let's put it that way. No, no, we just uh, we just didn't win any games. You, you're talking about the Cubs in '53 and Pittsburgh in '52. But that's a good right. experience when you play with losing teams because you get tired of hearing managers all of them before the season starts. They're all going to win. We're going to have nine guys. Um, in the American League, nine in the National League playing for the World Series. Listen to the managers, what they say in the paper. But that's good. That's good. Growing yeah, up in St. Louis. You're, growing you're up a 20-year-old guy in the World Series in 46. You must think you're going to be in the World Series every year, right? Well, you don't think of it every year because you know better. But, but what you do think is that you've got a pretty good ball club and you plug up a hole here or there and, and you're going to be contending. It's just like the Diamondbacks this year, you know. They had some guys that had some breakout years. Now, are they going to play playing the same way they played last year? If they do, they're going to compete. I'm not saying they're going to win, but they're going to be interesting to watch. But, you know, sometimes that, that year after the big year, uh, guys figure, well, you know, we'll get started, we'll get started. By the time you realize it, it's already August and September, and you haven't gotten the engine started. So... It'll be interesting. You, you know, you don't think you're going to win every year because you play in the World Series. Growing up in St. Louis with you and Yogi Bear on the same block, who was the better player growing up, you or Yogi? Oh, no question about it, Yogi. I mean, that's why it was so ridiculous when I, I kept hearing that the uh, that uh, Branch Rickey was with the Cardinals. He signed me, and that the uh, uh, he missed on Yogi. He didn't miss on Yogi, believe me, because it was it was about a week later, Yogi gets a call and says, uh, will you report to Bear Mountain and uh, go to spring training with the Dodgers? There was, uh, that was a warrior, of course, and that's why they were in Bear Mountain. But there was no doubt about it. In fact, the uh, famous Yankees, uh, what they did, they signed Yogi to a conditional contract. If they made the Norfolk team, he got a 500 a dollar bonus like Joey got, like I got, and and I had a terrible time getting a five hundred dollar bonus. Now today, with my agents and unions, you got to get three hundred thousand if they take the team picture. <laughs> Growing up, did you have any idea Yogi would end up being this iconic uh, ball player for a storied franchise like the Yankees? No, I wish I could say I thought that, but I, I knew that uh, Yogi was going to hit. Yogi could hit at midnight with a boomstick. Uh, he was always a good hitter. You know, when you play on, on the streets, and I'm sure you guys did, uh, the kids, the other guys will tell you who the best player is. And uh, uh, I was always the Avis guy. Yogi got picked first, I got picked second. So uh, there was no doubt about it that he was going to hit. And uh, one of the we we often talk about it. Uh, one of the things we'd love to have done was to uh, play more as teenagers, but we were always playing with older people because we were supposed to be able to compete, and we did. But uh, no, uh, I had no idea. I, I I knew he was a big leaguer, but I didn't think he was going to be the most valuable player and, and do what he did. I do know this. I said that Yogi could manage it, and and I, I just hate when I. I hear that stuff about, well, he's a malaprop and he's this and he's that. Yogi doesn't waste any time. And uh, he's very, 
He's very to the point. He's always been. He's been honest. And I just wish that people would forget about it when you come to the road and fork in the road, take it, and all that other stuff that they make up a lot of them. They blame me for a lot of it, and uh, some of these uh, the guys are, are absolutely wrong. They they think of things, and then they'll lay it on, on, on Yogi. In that September game at 47 with you and Jackie Robinson, what happened there? <laughs> that is ridiculous. That is ridiculous. First of all, it was no big deal. I mean, you did research, and one of the writers wrote in his book that I spiked Jackie. I did not spike Jackie. Eno Slaughter spiked him from his knee to his ankle, and uh, Jackie left the game. Jackie came up to hit, and what had happened was a rainy night, and Jackie had slipped and I stepped on the back of his shoe, and there was a nick in the shoe. And Beans Reardon was the umpire. And when Jackie came up to hit, he said, you all right? And Jackie said uh, he was all right with uh, added words or something, which I'm not going to repeat. And uh, I said, why don't you just get in and hit? And with that, here comes Sukaforth out of the dugout, running like crazy. He's going to protect Jackie. You think that Jackie wouldn't have knocked me 17 blocks from, from wherever, as big as he was and a great athlete? It was no confrontation. The confrontation came when uh, uh, Slaughter stepped on him in Ebbets Field. And uh, Maury Allen wrote the, in the book, that I spiked him, and I called Maury. I said, Maury, how could you write that in that book? People will read that. I had my granddaughter uh, call me and write to Daddy, uh, Grandpa, did you will really spike Jackie Robinson? I did not spike Jackie Robinson. I mean, he stayed in the game. And you can ask Branca or, or any of those guys that were there. They, they, they saw the play. But again, if it's written in a, in a book or a paper, uh, it goes as gospel, and it, it, it was ridiculous. Jackie stayed in the game, and and, and I, I, I've been friends. I was friends with him. I've been friends with Rachel for a long time. Saw her at the uh, uh, All Star game, and and uh, I had nothing but praise for Jackie as a player. I mean, we know what he did as a man, but this is a guy, and I'll just leave it at this. When people ask me, who is the toughest guy you ever? saw in baseball. There was no doubt in my mind. The guy, you always have a meeting and you ask the question in the meeting, who's the one guy you don't want to have on base when the game has to be tied or won? And when it was the Dodgers, you could forget about Camping, you could forget about Snyder, Perillo, Hodges, the rest of them. Jackie was the guy because if he got on first, you knew he was going to second. And if he got on second, he, he was always going to get a big lead, score easily, and uh, he was the most disruptive player on the bases. I, hey, we had a rundown one time. It was funny. We had six guys in the rundown that got an assist, I think, boy. I don't know. We were throwing that ball, and he kept running back and forth because Jackie could accelerate like I never saw anybody else. He he was going as fast as he could go with the first step, so – no, I, I I admired him, and I'm sorry that that happened. And that people like you, honestly doing your research, which is good, uh, asked the question. But uh, if Slaughter was here, he finally admitted it at a meeting at uh, college in uh, Rutgers. But up until then, he said, well, I play hard, and I do this, and I do that. Well, he also spiked him, but he never admitted it until it was way too late after it. I hope that answers your question. It, I think it does. Now, how how did you go from baseball to broadcasting? Who who made that well, brilliant decision? I wish I could answer that by saying that was my plan all along. Uh, when I was playing, we didn't make much money. <clears throat> I played nine years in the big leagues, and the most money I made was twelve thousand dollars. So uh, I had to work in the winter time, and it got to where I had a big injury in '50. That was another thing. I had a, uh, at first base, I tripped over Jackie Robinson's legs when he fell down again a rainy night in St. Louis. 
and I, I had a, a serious shoulder separation operation uh, in 1950, and I, I couldn't lift my arm. I mean, nobody wrote about that. I mean, Lord, you know, did he try to get even? Did he do this? It, it just happened. It was one of those things that happened. And uh, what it did, the doctor who operated was not a baseball fan, and I thank God for that, because he said to me, do you use that arm to throw? And I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, I'm not a baseball fan, but I'll tell you this, you would never be able to throw with your left arm. I said, well, that's good, because I throw with my right arm. And uh, But it was tough, and that's when I got traded uh, to the uh, Pittsburgh Pirates, and then I went to the Cubs, and then the Cubs sold me to the Giants, although I told them I was going to leave after the 54 season, but they said they wouldn't trade me, but they did, and uh, then I went into broadcasting. Uh, but I didn't go in immediately saying, well, here I am, broadcast world. I was selling everything. I sold used cars. I sold. Uh, uh, I worked at Sears. Yogi and I both worked at Sears to try to make some money. Uh, when I talk to young people, I tell them, look, Mr. Ricky used to always say success is opportunity plus ability. Be ready if the opportunity presents itself, if that's what you want. But I have a lot of young people who go to uh, a journalism school, and that's good, and, and they can learn better English and everything else. But don't come up to me and say, I know every statistic of every player. I know that. We got books full of it. We now have guys who sit in the broadcast booth and hand you these statistics, which wear me out. I don't like statistics that much. There are some that are worthwhile, but, I mean, like, uh, oh, man, I could go on forever. It, it, it's so true with statistics. They're like a lamppost to a drunk, something to lean on. If you can't think of anything and you haven't worked on it, you're going to lean on something, and you're going to say, well, here's Joe Garagio. He played Springfield, Missouri when he was 16 years old. He had 273 with 33 this and 14 that. And no. Make up your mind you got a goal, and don't let anybody deter you from that goal. Now, how do you prepare? I did not have the privilege of going to college and uh, I was lucky that uh, Bob Hyland of KMOX gave me the chance. I knew nothing about broadcasting. I had to have one of the broadcast guys sit next to me and tell me, you know, when I was going off the air. He would count down with his fingers because they'd, they'd tell me, you know, the producer would say, okay, you got to be off at uh, uh, 1226 or 1231 or whatever. Uh, what are you talking about? I don't know. So I, I had to learn to the hard way, but, but I stuck with it, and then people saw me at banquets and stuff, and, and once you hit a, oh, I, you got to have the right guy to see you. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a long story, but suffice it to say, I can never get on a Jack Parr show, but uh, I did the New York Writers Dinner with George Goebel, funny guy, and uh, uh, Jack Parr's neighbor said to him the next day, the way I heard the story, you got to put that ball-headed guy on your show. He knows a lot of funny baseball stories. Well, thank God that he thought they were funny and put me on, and, and that's what really started it. No, you're absolutely right. My great-great-uncle, who you were friends with, was the one who pushed me. He said, just don't go into sports gas and become an attorney, Jimmy DeVito. <laughs> well... You know, it, it's a, it's supposedly a glamorous business, and Jimmy was right. Yeah, I was in the Army with Jimmy, and then I used to see him when he was managing that softball team when I was broadcasting local baseball for the Cardinals, and uh, he was a good friend, and uh, he was right. I mean, there are guys now, you know, say, well, I graduated from so-and-so school, and I got a degree in broadcasting. Wonderful. Then you're prepared. Now you got to get a job, and... You don't start out. <clears throat> excuse me. You don't start out at the network. You start out at some small station where you can make mistakes because you need the experience, and experience is just a mistake you don't make twice. Now you went from baseball to the Today Show to the Westminster Kennel Club. <laughs> what, what? You, you've done just about everything. What, what was the most fun? 
They all were. Whatever I was doing was the most fun. I, the fella called me and said, uh, uh, would you be interested in doing a Westminster dog show? I said, I don't know anything about dogs except that I like them. I like dogs because my dogs, all they want to do is to be loved and, and be treated right. And if we could transfer that to other people, we, we'd have such a better world. And uh, he said, well, I watched you on the Rose Bowl Parade, and uh, if you could just bring some of that. I said, I don't know what I can bring, but uh, you can't compare anything to the Rose Bowl or even the Orange Bowl Parade or, or the Thanksgiving Day Parade. And I did all three of them for a number of years. And uh, because I said I had the best seat in the house, they were paying me for it, and you're watching a parade. And so I went there, and, and I would just play off David Fry, who was the expert. David Fry knew the breed of the dog and what they did and how they did it and so forth. And, and I would just ask questions uh, that I found interesting. And the thing I always got back was that uh, I was asking questions that a lot of people watching the show were asking, like, uh, you know, why do they lift the dog's back? two legs and rub him all over the place. If you did that to me on a table, I think I'd smile too. But uh, that kind of thing, and people got a big kick out of it. Is, is it true that Sam Musial told you to retire when he stepped in the batter's box the one game? <laughs> he was kidding, but he was right. Yeah. <laughs> I had just been traded. I think it was to the, either the Giants or the Cubs, and he hadn't seen the papers, I guess, because the Pittsburgh Cub trade was made at the ballpark in Pittsburgh, and he tapped the plate, looked at me, and he was almost shocked. And he said, uh, another team? I said, yeah. He said, why don't you quit? And I started laughing. I said, sure, if I could hit like you, I'd play forever. He was a great <laughs> hitter. He was a great hitter. He, and I'll never forget Chicago for, for a couple plays. Uh, Oh, a lot of plays. The stand was in him. I mean, that's where he got his 3,000th hit. And what a train ride that was back to St. Louis. Every small city along the way, there were people out at the railroad tracks waving. And it was just a marvelous trip. And then the time that the ball got by, I was broadcasting the game, and it got by Hundley, and it went for Pat Piper used to sit by the by the cage back there with the base, bag of baseballs, and the ball went there, and Alvin Dark grabbed the ball out of the bag and threw it, and there were two balls in play, and guys were running all over the place. It looked like a Ringling Brothers against the Harlem Globetrotter game. It was funny, but uh, I had some great memories of uh, Chicago, by the way. Not that I can remember all of them, but I, I, I've had a good ride. I really have. God has blessed me. Now, you made it to the Hall of Fame, not as a player, but as a broadcaster in 91. What was that like? Well, that was that was a big, big thrill. It was unexpected because uh, they said I was the first major league player to go to the broadcaster's wing. And even when I'm asked to sign baseballs, uh, some of the collectors will say, would you put Hall of Fame on there? I said, well, I, you know, I'm not in the Hall of Fame. I... I'm in the broadcast wing of the Hall of Fame. The Hall of Fame are places where you got Ruth and Garrick and Yogi and, and Musial and Aaron and Willie Mays and all those great ball players. I, I, I would just, when you're in the broadcast wing, you feel, well, I'm in the building. Maybe they'll let me go out and get the coffee, you know, that kind of thing. It was a tremendous thrill because, as I say, I, I did not train myself. I, I wanted to be a, a baseball player. And uh, you have to understand, uh, uh, I grew up like Yogi in a neighborhood that was uh, uh, all Italian, spoke Italian, uh, homilies in church were in Italian, and uh, my parents, my father only <laughs> went to one game. My mother went to that same game, and that was it. And in fact, one of the, not disappointments, but one of the things that you wish they understood more, but you know, they came from the old country and my mother was was not a naturalized citizen and <laughs> once a year we had to go downtown. That's the only time she ever went downtown to to register. And uh, uh you, you just wish that they would know because I I go on like a Johnny Carson show and the people in the neighborhood, uh, you know, people my age and, and, and older 
spoke English and watched television, they would say, man, you're on Johnny Carson's show, huh? What's he like? Blah, blah, blah. And my mother would say, hey, you're on television. I said, yeah, ma. Good. And that was it. <laughs> but uh, that's okay. That's okay because they were good parents. Good parents. And the one thing that they taught all of us, Yogi, Poochie, River, Nana, all the guys, help the other guy. There was a widow that lived on the street. She never had to worry about her grass being cut. And in those days, they delivered coal in the back of the alley. We had to go there and unload it and put it in their basement. And that's what it's all about. You know, Muhammad Ali's got a great line that, that I use all the time. He says that service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. Think of that. No, you're Service, absolutely right. Uh, People forget that. What do you think about Albert Pujols leaving the Cardinals? I mean, Stan Musial has been Musial's town for 50 years, and Pujols could have carried the tradition, but he decided to go where the money was. I don't blame him at all, and I'd be willing to bet my life that if Musial was offered that money, he'd go too. I mean, I'd like to meet the first guy who says, oh, don't give me all that money. I don't deserve it. You know, you talk about loyalty and all that. It works on both sides. It works on both sides. Yes, the fans of St. Louis were great to him. But think about it now. He does not have to worry about his future. I mean, he's not going to be, unfortunately, like Alvin Iverson, who's gone bankrupt after making millions of dollars. I, You know, I can't be critical of him. I don't know what he did with it, but I know this. Pujols has got a nice family. He takes care of people. Uh, I... Somebody came to you, and, and, and your, your, your owners or your, your bosses would say, oh, stay with us, come on. So we, we hired you when, when you couldn't even hardly talk, and, and now you're going to leave us. But they don't ever say, well, if you stay, I'll give you a tremendous raise. No, I, I cannot be critical of Pujols. I cannot, and I'm sorry for the fans because he's a great ball player, and he will continue to be a great ball player. But don't, don't, don't let that money enter into it. I mean, stop to think of it. A, a player coming to the big leagues makes the roster, the pay for the first year player is $311,000. Come on. Look at the paper every day. This side trying to make an eight million six. You have to look at the bubble gum cards to find out who he is. No, you're right. And now the broadcasts are making big money, too, which is scary. Oh, everybody. Everybody. The only place you don't make any money is making speeches for some of the service clubs, you know. And uh, you have to tell these people, hey, I got a family. I, I traveled all my life. Uh, uh, I, like now, you know, I'm coming off serious surgery in 2009. I was in a hospital all of uh, 2009. And now that I'm on, people see me. First thing they think of, hey, can you come talk to our guys? Oh, good bunch of guys. I said, yeah. Oh, and we'll give you a good meal. I said, really? I'm really happy to hear that because my wife, I'm telling you, I'm sick of those catcher's mitts she's making. She makes great catcher's mitts. But, uh, you know, pe people, it's a self-centered world, and they'll say, oh, that guy's not worth it. He's worth what he's able to get, and with the agents, and some of them are good, and some of them are bad, and uh, the prices at the ballpark is, is going sky high for basketball, for foot. Look at the Super Bowl. I read somewhere where a ticket was $2,500. I mean, that, that, uh, let, let's not price ourselves away from the people. That, that's the only thing, because you've got to get the money someplace. Yeah, you used to be able to buy a car for $2,500. Oh, a good one, too. A new one. <laughs> when you go out to dinner with Tommy Lasorda, who picks up the check? Tommy does and hands it to you. <laughs> he, he doesn't believe. He thinks it's un American. <laughs> he's, he's great, though. He said he never missed a meal. Skipped a few and came back, but he never missed it. You know, he, he's good for baseball. And when that whole Dodger thing is unraveled and everything is straight, Lasorda will be standing on his feet telling you once again. I bleed Dodger blue. He uh, he's good for baseball, really good for baseball. 
Now, was the Cardinal broadcast crew with you and Harry Carey and Jack Buck about it as good as ever existed? And how did you guys not kill one another? Oh, well, there was no sense of killing one another. You'd have to go to court and miss the pain. <laughs> no, uh, we got along fine. Jack Buck was a talented guy, as you guys had Harry for, for a while, and, and he kind of changed his whole uh, style, you know. I mean, uh, in Chicago, I know he is known best for uh, singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game, but Harry was a, a good broadcaster. And he was exciting, and he was controversial, and he, he you know, he, he did some things that I'm sure, like the rest of us, we do them in a spur of the moment, and then after a while we regret them. But uh, that was a good broadcast. Harry recommended me, and, and uh, yeah, we had our bad days, and we had some arguments, but when it was over with, we had a, what we thought was a good broadcast. My favorite I can, I, can, I can remember listening to Harry on Camel X, and these were the early days of transistor radios. I went went to a ball game, listened to the radio, and watched the game, and it was almost like two different games were going on. The one he was describing was so much more exciting than the one I was watching. <laughs> you, you should have been able to sit next to him. I mean, he'd be going on and on, and you'd look down the field, and all you saw was a guy taking a drink of water. But he <laughs> great. He, he, he didn't lie. He did not lie. He, he had a lot of excitement. And uh, he, he was a very opinionated guy, which I think for some broadcasters uh, it pays off. And for him it did. Uh, he was, and, and Jack Buck, uh, he, he left us too soon. He was really a talented guy. If you ever had the chance to hear Buck work a banquet, you, knew what, you know what I'm talking about because he had a great sense of humor. And uh, everybody liked him in St. Louis. And, well, Harry's in the Hall of Fame, and as is Jack, so uh, that's great. My favorite moment, I think, in baseball was that World Series with Kirk Gibson hitting that home run. I was sitting watching it with my fam when I said, this is incredible. This is what baseball's all about. Well, it was a, there were a couple of them that I remember like that. That was one of them. The funny thing about it, that if you remember, everybody remembers the home run, and rightly so. But the pitch before that, Gibson, came, he made the worst swing of a baseball player and fouled it off, which was a good piece of hitting, which got lost in the transition. It was like uh, Bernie Carbo in 75 with the Red Sox. He fouled off the pitch sideways, and he stayed alive. The next pitch, he hits the home run. It looks like it's going to win the game for the Red Sox. It didn't. And uh, you know, Gibson, when he came out of there limping like he did, the crowd went crazy, the excitement, and, and I was working with Vince Scully then, great broadcaster, and uh, when he hit the home run, it, it just was bedlam, and I, in fact, the next day I said to uh, Eckersley, what in the world were you thinking about throwing him a slider when he fouled off fastball sideways, and boy, to Eckersley's credit, and I love pitches like this, and this is why it was so great. He said, that was really a dumb pitch, wasn't it? And he admitted it, and life went on. But that was exciting. Oh, and, and, and Gibson milked it for all it was worth. And he's done a great job here for these Diamondbacks. I, I tell you, he's won me over as a manager. He's got these guys believing. He's in the paper today saying, uh, well, yes, uh, if we play like we did last year and play hard. They came from behind 48 times. That's unheard of to win a game in the ninth inning uh, and eighth inning uh, by coming from behind. But uh, he had these guys really believing that they could win and just play to the best of your ability. And I tell you, man, he he did a tremendous job and certainly deserved that Manager of the Year award that he got. Who was the best ball player you ever saw? Me? <laughs> no. Other than you, other than you, and Yogi. I'm only It's very difficult because I never, I never saw some of those grades. I would love to have seen Waller Johnson pitch. I would love to have seen Babe Ruth, and Garrett hit. The best ball player. The way I, I would answer that question in my time, and if I had five dollars, 
They said you can't spend it any other place. Who would you want to see play? And there were two guys. Jackie Robinson was one, and Willie Mays was the other. Because Willie Mays was an exciting player. Oh, he was excited. He made great plays. He ran hard, threw hard, swung hard, got the job done. And, and you know what Jackie could do. Uh, they were not one-dimension players by any means, and, and that's what's important. You know, like you get asked, who's the best hitter? How can you pick uh, the best hitter when guys like uh, Musial and Ted Williams and Joe DiMaggio and you know, put Yogi in there because – Paul Richards always said he was the toughest hitter in the eighth and ninth inning in baseball. So uh, it, it's hard to pick a guy. Uh, I I, uh, I didn't see Williams that much. I saw him in the World Series, and people said, well, he didn't hit much. He didn't get any hits, but there were some tremendous plays made. Harry Walker made two great plays. Terry Moore in center field. I can still see Terry robbing him of, of extra base hits. So uh, I, I saw some great hitters, and, and – uh, I have a, a script of an interview I did with Williams that I cherish. I will not send it to anybody because we used it, and uh, I, I reread it. He studied hitting. He knew hitting. And DiMaggio, hey, DiMaggio was DiMaggio, you know. Uh, so uh, the best player, it's like asking who's the best pitcher. <laughs> I faced a lot of guys, and I can't pick a guy by, by how they got me out because they did and I, I had some good pitchers that I caught so uh, it, it's a very difficult question and I can just give you some of my observations What surprised me is most players say Willie Mays but one of Willie Mays teammates, Monty Irvin said no it was Josh Gibson, Gibson was the best he ever saw Well that's understandable but we didn't get the pleasure and the blessing of seeing Josh Gibson. Now, did we see Satchel Paige in his uh, uh, early days? We didn't get to see Cool Papa Bell. I mean, the great story that Cool tells, and I have it on tape. I, I did an interview with Cool Papa Bell and, and, and Satchel Paige when I was doing the baseball world. And I said, tell me how good a ball player Jackie Robinson was. He said, well, we knew in the Negro League that he wasn't going to make it as a shortstop. And their manager... They were playing against Jackie's team, said, cool, do me a favor and hit ground ball when you're batting to Jackie because you'll beat it out. And, and he did. He, did he, he said he hit three of them, and uh, he beat them all out. And Jackie fielded the ball cleanly. Uh, and, and that proved to him that shortstop was the most difficult position, especially to try to make that play in a hole or behind second base with a guy like Cool Papa Bell. If you bunt it on Cool, I'll tell you how fast he was, and the third baseman came in to feel it, you'd make the play at first base, and then you'd look up and say, how'd he get to third base? Did he cut across the field? So we missed him. We missed uh, Double Duty Radcliffe. Uh, hey, I got to know a lot of them. Jimmy Crutchfield, right from Chicago, uh, good outfielder. Uh, I wish we would have been able to see those guys. Josh Gibson, I mean... Everybody talks about the monumental home runs. Uh, I got to know a lot of them when I was uh, with that baseball assistance team because uh, they were not being taken care of, and they were professional baseball players, and, and they were kept out of baseball for no other reason than the way they were born. And that's not right because none of us, none of us filled out any papers saying, I want to be uh, born white and I want to be uh, born to Italian parents or whatever. Uh, we're here, and, and God's got a job for us. And, and if you get sick like I did, you say, I hope you got another job for me, God, and make it a long-term baby. So anyhow, I uh, know Josh Gibson, boy, I'd love to have seen him. In fact, i got a Kansas City Monarch shirt that I treasure, and i got a Homestead Gray's cat. Yeah. Well, how about Piper Davis? I mean, the shortstop. He, they tell me he was a magician with the glove. And I think he put that whole integration thing in, in place. Uh, he was on the Coast League. Gene Mock told me this story. He said, boy, that was a great guy, Piper Davis. He was using, I was using his glove. This is Gene talking, he said. And uh, the Red Sox bought Gene, and he went to Piper, and he said, Piper, I'm 
I just was bought by the Red Sox, and I'm going to Fenway Park. I can give you a glove bag. And he delivered a very profound statement that I think sizes it all up. He said, no, take it with you to Fenway. It's the only way that glove will ever get into that ballpark. That's pretty deep. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Garagio. It was a pleasure talking to you.